Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I am excited to be here today with Amani Roberts. We're going to be talking about the power of live streaming and how it can really amplify what you're already doing, get you in front of new audiences, and really generate those super fans. And um, we're also going to be talking about his experience as a DJ, his experience writing books that are helpful for the music industry. He's a professor, all kinds of cool things. But let me let him tell you a little bit about his background to start us off. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me, Bree. I'm very excited to be here with you and your community. My background, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, went to Howard University. I grew up working in hotels, Merritt Hotels, for almost 20 years. Then I began to be a DJ kind of full-time at the same time. I've been a DJ now for almost 15 years, music producer for about five years. And as you said, I'm really active in live streaming. I do a lot of work on Twitch. Um, I'm a professor and co-director at Cal State University Fullerton. And I've written one book and have a second book that's in progress. And that's a quick background about me. That's awesome. That's that's a lot of things. And I love that because as a musician, I always encourage people to kind of stack those income streams. You know, you've got your professor job and your writing here, you know, but of course, writing books that takes a while um, and you're doing other things. So with the live streaming, how did you get started with that? You know, April 2020, really March, April 2020, I usually do a podcast and I interview people in person. Um, We couldn't do that starting in March 2020, so I wanted to continue that, so I started to live stream it. And at first I was doing just live streaming my podcast on Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. And then I began to also see other DJs. We were all like live streaming and trying out things on Facebook and Instagram. And we would get cut off due to all the licensing issues and everything like that. Mm. We get cut off. But Twitch, you know, it was a, a godsend for us because they do have a public performance license. So we can perform live and not get cut off. Now, the video and the recordings that gets muted out because of the restrictions. But at least we can DJ a set for one, two, three, four, five hours, not get interrupted, start to build a community there. And that really began around like April or May of 2020. And it was ironic because in the class that I teach at Fullerton, we covered Twitch and live streaming. And I was actually, you know, all in it, really learning from learning on the fly, as we say. Wow, I'm impressed that you cover that in your class. And I know I got to speak to to some of your students and I love that you are covering like really current topics. Most schools, I think, still aren't doing that. Some of them are trying to get into talking about digital marketing and online and social media and all of that stuff. But I think some of them are still kind of in the dark ages or they're focused <laughs> only on the performance side. And, you know, like my experience coming out of school now that granted this was back in the 90s, but coming out of school, I came out and incredible musician with so many skills my music theory was like top notch all of that my performing but i had no clue about the business stuff they taught us not a single thing but i know at fullerton you're you have like a a music business club and and classes and things like that so i definitely want to commend you on that thank you we we really want to focus on closing the knowledge gap as you spoke between independent or new musicians and like they don't know everything like record label executives know or things or people in that kind of uh, field but I feel it's really important for anyone to know kind of how the royalties work streaming we even cover NFTs which kind of popped up last Mm. year and were really big for musicians but we don't know if it's a scam or if it's true we talk about that we talk about the waterfall strategy just anything current I'll add into the class just so that we can be, as you say, kind of on the cutting edge and knowledgeable so we can then advise other musicians because 
you know, our students, they will have up and coming musicians as their clients. So we need to keep them on the, the cutting edge in terms of the knowledge, the information and the strategy. So that's really important for us at Fulton. And we, we do a good job of that. I've also created and um, trying to get a intro to music business class added. That's something I'm really passionate about, too, at the school. Mm, I love that. So. I also love that you were kind of experimenting with the stuff as you were teaching it, right? Because I think that that's one of the best ways is to really have that personal experience and like test things out and then be able to share that with your students. So when you were doing that with Twitch, like what were some of the first things that you discovered that you started telling your students, oh, this this is why this is going to be helpful for you? Look, there's probably three things I discovered right off the bat. The first thing was you don't need to go out and buy all sorts of different equipment. Use what you have to just get started. I think mm, 50 to 70 percent of people look at live streaming and they don't get started because they're scared. Either they feel like they don't have the equipment, they feel that no one's going to tune into their live stream or that they will start it and no one will show up. So it'll be a waste. But I think that's the wrong kind of perspective. I think you have to start where you are, start to build a community. If you have one, two or three, five people in your stream and then build from that. Um, finally, I, I completely underestimated the power and value of merch. Merch, people will buy a t-shirt from you, a mug, a keychain. And if you just set up a quick little merch shop and you're streaming on Twitch or online and you offer that, people will like you, they'll buy it. And really, we have the old kind of uh, Kevin Kelly rule. It's like you only need like you know 100 true fans, then you get to 1,000 true fans. And that is definitely reachable within a streaming platform. I grew my platform from one person following me to now a year and a half later, you know, I have almost 46, almost 5,000 people that follow. I was finally able to achieve partner status on Twitch after a long road. So if you put the work in, it can be some definite benefits. Wow. So let's talk about merch. What do you find is the best way to offer it on live stream? Do you set up you know it on, on your website and send them there or do you try to keep them within the platform does twitch have the ability to sell things directly yeah you can set up like a different little bots in within your stream where they'll pop up and say if you're looking for merch click here it'll take them to the shop right away you mm -hmm. can show your merch on the screen you can have little pop-ups about merch you can wear it when you're wearing on stream, people are like, I love that shirt. I mean, that's the easiest way right there. Super smart, yes. Yes, exactly. You can do giveaways. I did raffles for a portion giveaway merch, and it's just like slow and steady income, but it builds up. And then, you know, anyone can buy your merch, and people can discover you. And it's not like it's going to give you a substantial amount of money right away. But as you say, I love how you said that stacking your income streams, it's just something little that's stripping here and there brings in things. One month you could get a lot, a month you could get half of that, but it works and it's just really effective. And I had, I completely underestimated that before I even started. That's cool. Now, what about like tips? Do you also take tips as well? Cause of course we want to like make as much income as possible. I know you're going live like three days a week, right? Correct. Yeah. You can do donations or tips, which is kind of outside of the Twitch's ecosystem. You can also do something what they call like bits, which is within Twitch's ecosystem. People can give you bits, which is virtual tipping. People can then subscribe. You get a portion of that revenue. I get a lot of probably majority of my revenue through the virtual bits that they do within Twitch's system, then subscription revenue, then donations. But you can absolutely get donations. People will love to send you the revenue directly to your cash app, PayPal, Venmo. Uh, and if you know, once you build a nice following of 50, 70 people and you consistently stream like that's going to add up. Plus, you're creating a portfolio of your business live in person. I've had clients watch me on Twitch and I wasn't aware. And then when they hire me, they say, you know, I found you on Twitch. I was watching mm -hmm. your stream for many weeks and we just love what you're doing. We wanted to hire you. And it's it's real. It really happens. Yeah. So for musicians who aren't DJs, like they can get bookings from just people finding them on somewhere like Twitch. Exactly. You can live stream on like Twitch or YouTube. Those are probably the two most popular, two most effective. Um, people will hire you to do in-person gigs, even virtual gigs. I've gotten lots of virtual gigs too. And people will look and say, they say, okay, we want to hire money. He's streaming this day. Just take a look at him for 15, 30 minutes. They'll see what's going on. They'll say, okay, I like it. Let's book him. And it happens consistently. Mm, 
that is amazing. So we've already counted at least three income streams here from just the live streaming. Yes. Right now, what is the what is the subscriptions all about? Okay, so and I'll speak specifically to Twitch, which is where I spend the majority of my time. Is like there are three subscription levels. You have tier one, which is five dollars a month. Tier two, which is uh, I want to say tier two is ten dollars a month, and tier three is twenty five dollars a month. Um, people will subscribe to you, which means they get special little emotes, which are like personalized emojis, and you get half of that revenue. You get two fifty for the tier one, you get uh, five dollars for the tier two, and you get twelve fifty for the tier three. Now, if you advance and become a partner, which is one of Twitch is kind of exclusive status levels. Once you reach a certain uh, threshold of requirements, you can get 70% of the tier three revenue and because that's the split, the split goes up. So that's subscription mm -hmm. revenue. That's kind of your base. The best thing to do is get people to subscribe to your channel on a monthly basis. You get half of that. That's a good base amount of revenue. They also have a system in place where people can gift subs like if you're watching my stream or we're watching a friend of your stream i can gift you a sub to their channel which means i'm going to treat you to a sub to their channel for one month mm. and that's another way people will give you'll get kind of revenue to gifting subs regular subs and people can also sub one channel per month via amazon prime and you get 50 percent of that revenue oh that's interesting <laughs> okay i didn't know that about amazon prime yeah because amazon owns twitch Yes, and that's is that pretty recent? How long ago did they buy um, Twitch? I think that's like the f five years ago. Oh, okay, it's so it's about not that five recent. or six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they, but they they're very present there, so that's a fact. Got it. Okay, so that's another income stream. So we've got four now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then now with the partner thing, is does do you have to? say that you're going to exclusively go live on Twitch if you are a partner? So once you get to partner status, you can only live stream on one platform. So what I do is like I'll stream DJing, I have game shows, I'll stream on Twitch, and then after 24 hours, I'll put up the stream on YouTube. So you just go back and forth with Twitch and YouTube. So you stream live on Twitch, download it, then you wait the next day and upload it on YouTube. So then that's what YouTube is good for. In my opinion, live stream on YouTube is not there yet. They're quickly um, adding some more features to compete with Twitch, but really YouTube is for like the repository. So people can go and look at it after the stream. And so that's kind of the process I follow. Got it. Now, have you done anything with say Facebook Live or Instagram Live, or do you feel like these other two that you've been talking about are really more the forerunners? So for me, when I do a talk show, I have a talk show I do once, you know, two or three times a month, I will stream that live to Facebook Live. Instagram Live, it just doesn't work well with kind of um, my audience and just making sure it works with the camera and everything. So it doesn't work the best. Um, I'm still investigating different ways to use that. So I will do Facebook Live for the talk show. Um, we also will do premieres. So like if I do a premiere of a game show, I might do it to Facebook Live also. But really, I try to stick to Twitch first, then YouTube after is kind of where I'm going. Got it. And do you have any tech stack? Are you going direct or using something like OBS or StreamYard or something in between to kind of like add, add you know, uh, titles and things yeah. like that and make the, the tech part easier? So I use both. So for the, the talk show, I'll go StreamYard to uh, Twitch right there. And I have like overlays and all that. We have sound effects, all sorts of crazy things. Mm. For DJing and some other interactive shows, I use OBS. Um, and remember, I'm learning all these platforms from <laughs> scratch from like, I didn't know anything. And to be honest, I was afraid of OBS because it's quite daunting. Me too. I'm <laughs> I've looked at it and I'm like, oh, this is too yeah. many dials and things for me. It is. And I had a friend of mine, DJ Ivy, she said, you know, you need to use OBS because your sound quality will improve more than when it's on StreamYard. Because StreamYard, the sound, specifically when you're DJing, is not the best. So she gave me a quick 90 minute crash course in OBS. I jumped in and I've been learning about it ever since. For the game shows, I mean, we are doing some pretty interactive and cool game shows. And we use a combination of OBS, uh, Twitch, and Zoom. OBS Ninja, we use all these different platforms because I have someone helping me with those. But um, just the way it looks, it's like a real game show. You have people in the little boxes playing and the noise and the sound effects. So I've advanced very quickly in only a year and a half. It's like um, it's like a really intense college, you know, 
program. It's you know the the, the university of live streaming, but I've come <laughs> a long way in like eighteen months. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you could teach a whole class on it now. <laughs> I mean, it's getting to that point, and I feel, it's funny you say that, I feel <laughs> that it's it's worth it because I don't think it's going away. I think this is a new way of like live interactive TV, similar to how like Netflix, I forget the name of the show they have, but they have a choose your own adventure show on Netflix, which is interacting with the audience, mm. which is pretty popular. And I think that this is kind of the future. And I think people will clamor for this moving forward. Yeah, it sounds really cool. It makes me want to check out the game show because I'm super competitive. Uh, yes. So give uh, our listeners a little bit of information on what the game show is and how they can find it. So the game shows, what we do now is we have probably about four or five game shows that we play on a weekly basis. Usually Wednesday is game night and every Monday, every other Monday we'll have games too. I'll do Name That Tune. We'll do Family Feud. We'll do our version of Hollywood Squares. We'll do our version of The Masked Singer. We call it Who Is That Voice? We're premiering Wheel of Fortune on Monday, this coming Monday, we do that one. Now in the past, we've also done a dating game. We've done a newlywed game. (laughs) We've done Survivor. Um, So we have all these games that we can do and people, like they like to switch, they like to interact, they like to play along in the chat. This past, what did we do this past week? This past week we had Hollywood Squares and so we asked questions and people are answering the chat and they just, I noticed that, that people really like that and they like to compete. As you said, like you, you're very competitive. So they wanna get the answers. Now of course, maybe they're Googling at the same time, but we go along quick enough so they can't really do that too much but it's fun and people engage. And then I can bring different communities together. Like if you're streaming, I can have you as a contestant. So all your community will come and support, bring other community support. So it helps networking. It Mm -hmm. helps to grow the audience and it's just something different. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Now, are you just doing that as like a a separate thing because it's fun or are you tying that into your DJing audience? Like how, how does that kind of fit into the ecosystem of income for you? I'm glad you asked that. So <laughs> I did it at first just to see if I could do it. Um, <laughs> and then remind me to ask, to, to tell you, we also did an award show, which was a major endeavor, but which follows this theme. I did it first to see if I can do it. But then when I saw how successful it was, I realized that I can also pitch this to my corporate clients. Like I can tell a corporate client, yes, I can DJ a reception for you. That's easy. We, we can do that every day. But also if you have a break and instead of just letting people walk away from the conference or if it's a virtual conference, instead of having people let me log off and go for a walk, we can host a quick little game show. It can mm-hmm. be the match game. That's another game show we do, the match game, the one that's hosted by Alec Baldwin. We can do Family Feud, something that will allow the audience to participate, some of the corporate executive to participate, to make them show that they're more human. A lot of times when you go to conferences, you see people up on stage and talking, they kind of are so far away that they, they look just kind of a little disconnected. But if you do a game show as a break, it just it's fun, it lets people get to know each other and it's memorable. And so I've been pitching it to corporate clients and gotten some interest. So that's now I'm using what we're doing on Twitch as like a portfolio. This is what we can do. This we can offer your clients. What a great idea. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, (laughs) if you, like you said, if you've already got a corporate client that you're doing something for, why not give them more things that they can add on and pay you for and, you know, like getting more per customer, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's the goal is just to use the customers you have to just offer more options for them to spend money with you, basically. (laughs) Super, super smart. Um, Yeah, I would love to have that. If I was at a retreat or something, I would love to have that as a break instead of just, you know, sitting around or whatever. That would be super fun. And I would want to be like showing off to my peers that I could, you know, win Name That Tune or whatever it is. Yes, yes. Oh, that'd be fun. Um, We do Name That Tune. We also have the lyrics. So you can hear it. Then round two is the lyrics. So keep that in mind when you're preparing. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how I I think I'm better at the Name That Tune part, but I'll I'll have to try it out and see. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the award show. Oh, so this one, and you know, I give credit to my girlfriend. She mentioned this to me in January. She said, you know what? We see all these streamers doing great work for people, you know, who are locked at home starting in March, April, you know, because music, as you know, music can save lives. Music can be very therapeutic. And people, there were many DJs across the world that were DJing on Twitch, on live from March, April through now. 
So I didn't see it for myself in January. I just couldn't get my hand head around it because I didn't think it was possible. But once I did the dating game and show I could pull that off through StreamYard, once I did a couple other shows, I said, okay, it can maybe work. So then we talked about it again in June, July. I said, okay, now's the time. A whole year has pretty much passed. So people have put up, built up a, about a year's worth of audience and work. So we did this award show called the Twitch TV Awards. We had 25 categories. We had a call for nominations so the public could vote and put in nominations. We then had a committee of people pick five DJs or streamers from each category. And we had a nomination show. So we had a nomination show live on Twitch. We streamed that with the co-host and all that, kind of like they do the Grammys. Our model was the Grammys. We model everything after the Grammys because mm. they have a committee. And then then we had open voting after the nomination show for three weeks and then we had the award show and once again I can take this exact program and pitch it to a client because we can follow the exact same procedure we have awards right now we're sending out um, I don't think I have it but we have like a poster with the awards on it we created special emotes we, we did a whole award show with uh, voiceover work graphics, we did everything. And we just had the award show a week and a half ago. Very successful. People from around the world were tuned in. It's ironic, we had it at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We had several people win awards that were in the UK and Italy, and they were logged on at 2 a.m. their oh time God. to give their acceptance speech. It was the coolest thing. And it was, it was very successful. Of course, there are things we can improve for next year, but it was good. And then to go back to my students, I also teach a project management class and I used this award show as a case study for us to go through as I went through the whole process so they could follow along and see what the plan was. So that's the award show. Very successful. We'll do it again next year. Lots of learning, but it's a great case study because now I can pitch this to clients too. Oh gosh. Yeah. You're just, <laughs> you're building all kinds of income options here with trying yes. out these new things. I'm like, okay, now I've done this. Now I can pitch it to clients. I can explain to them why it's cool and yeah. why they would want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else that we haven't discussed on live streaming? Cause I feel like you just gave them like a really good masterclass in 15 <laughs> minutes about why they would want to get live streaming or if they are already live streaming, why they might want to consider Twitch for doing their live streaming because there are all of those income options that are built in. I think the only thing to add is really more like mental, just mindset, just try it out. Don't be discouraged if there's two or three people in your stream, share it with people, network with other streamers, almost spend more time in other people's streams than you do streaming yourself. I think that's one thing that's missed and don't be afraid to network and work with smaller streamers. Like I started as a small streamer. It has taken me a year and a half to grow. Like I said, I just got to partner status like two weeks ago today. Mm, and this was after applying for it five times and getting declined. <laughs> so I got accepted on the sixth time. So it, you really have to stick with it and have some resilience. But I just feel that, you know, Twitch is just a, it's just another platform. If you're going to be on Instagram and promote your services, what you do, if you're going to be on Facebook or Twitter, you absolutely should be live streaming, especially in the music industry. There's some of my favorite musicians that I've discovered, like a Jane Rio. She'll sit there, open her lunch, eat her lunch. She'll sing a couple songs, take requests. She'll show the process of how she writes music. And people love that. They love to see that. And there's also music producers on there that do phenomenal things. Ill Mind producer, Bus Crates, Flipside, like they all are showing their process. Um, Kenny Beats, and it's just, that's what people are looking for. They want to learn, they want to see how you do it, they want to just get closer. And this allows for one-on-one -on -one or one to a hundred interaction. So my main message is try it out, don't give up, stick with it and network. Yeah, you make a good point because that's really the same thing that you should you need to do in any situation where you're new. Like if you're trying a new social media platform, as you said, like, go into other people's streams or other people's feeds and interact and make connections because yeah at first you're not going to have a lot of people coming to commenting on your stuff you've got to kind of put yourself out there and bring people over by them seeing that you add value and you know that you're interesting absolutely and just be authentic <clears throat> and good things will happen be patient too <laughs> yes, which is yes. hard. That's hard. <laughs> you definitely have to be patient. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about DJing because I know that you've written a book about DJing and, you know, I'm assuming you teach kind of becoming a DJ as a business. And those of us who are musicians, like I have no experience in DJing, but I love music and I'm, I'm a podcaster. I ran an online radio station. I I was like the mixtape queen when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, so I do know, have some musician friends that have gone this direction and it could completely be another income stream. So maybe talk a little bit about how you can figure out if that's kind of the right direction to go. In terms of DJing, and if you have the equipment and have the desire to learn, um, it can be very, very uh, fruitful financially and also personally. Like DJing and playing music for me and seeing when you play a song on and people are singing along and then you drop the volume and people are still singing along, like that's a really, really warm feeling there that is really hard to duplicate. So if, if you have the ability and the desire to learn, it can be very beneficial. I think that once again, it comes back to like networking. I would not be where I am today as a DJ. A good example is that uh, without networking, a good example would be last night I was DJing in front of about 4,000 people downtown LA at Xbox Plaza for a client that I really acquired through networking. I'm a part of a couple professional associations like Meeting Professors International. Um, Also ASCAP is the music one that I'm a part of. And just for meeting people and working with them back and forth. Someone came to me and said, okay, I'm having an event in LA. I know you through MPI. Can you DJ this date? I said, yes, it worked out. I got my start DJing in clubs through another DJ colleague who wanted me to come and open up for them, which is very similar to the music industry where I played from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Then he took over from 11 to 1.30. And so there's just different ways to get into it. I also attended Scratch Academy so I could learn all the fundamentals of DJing and really build a strong foundation. And that really set me up because, you know, I know how to DJ. I can scratch, blend, juggle, mix, Mm. all that programming. I could do all those things. And I wouldn't have learned that if I didn't go to Scratch Academy. But because I went to that school twice, once for DJing and once for music production, I was able to build a strong community of people around me that, you know, refer me, I can learn with, I can talk to when we're having tough times. So I think you add all that up. And if you want to be a DJ, it's possible. You just have to put the work in. Yeah. You, you, like you said, you put in the work and you found the, the training that you needed and that allowed you to connect with the people that ended up being connections for you down the road. I mean, that's true of anything that we want to learn in music or life Mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to like, I don't have a lot of experience with the DJing as live streaming. And I know this is a big thing now because I have friends that do it, but I don't quite understand it. Like I get DJing live, right? Like that's like fun and exciting for the people that are at the event. But why do people tune into DJ live streams? They tune into DJs live streaming for like the DJ, for the people that they're gonna see in the chat and for the music they could be exposed to. DJing and live streaming is not easy. If you have, if we're regularly DJing out at a club, bar, or party, you have to play to the crowd, but you can see the crowd. You just have to really manage, make sure your sound is okay, and then you have to manage the music you're playing and the crowd. Whereas live streaming, you got to make sure your sound is okay. You got to make sure your camera is okay. You have to make sure that um, you're marketing your stream so people will show up. Then you have to make sure that when people do show up, you shout them out in the chat and you continue to engage with them. Then you have to create different things like emotes and channel points so that your stream is very interactive. You have to have, you know, some cool overlays. You don't have to. Like there's a DJ I know, Kev G, he didn't have an overlay for a long time and does phenomenal. But you have to do something that catches people's eye on the screen so that they, you know, they stay engaged. So like for DJing, normally in traditional aspects, you're like, triple maybe quadruple tasking Mm -hmm. i don't know the proper word for live stream but it's like you have to do six or seven things at once consistently and it's a lot you have to watch do all sorts of things you have moderators that will assist you to make sure the chat stays safe but really you're just playing music it's like you're playing your own virtual concert and people are in the chat commenting coming and going cheering putting up emotes it's like you can feel the energy because it's through the chat it's just different 
but it's cool. It's easy. It's safe. You're at home. You, you can use a green screen. Like I've acquired a green screen. Now I use a green screen for different graphics. It's like a show. It's like your own personal show. And like your stream is like your own personal venue. And you're welcoming people into your venue. And you want to make sure that they feel at home and that they keep coming back. So people basically come for the community of, of like-minded people that like similar kinds of music. And they also come for being exposed to new music that they wouldn't necessarily get exposed to. I guess I was comparing it to like, well, couldn't I just pull up a, a Spotify playlist of the kind of music that I might like and listen to that? And I was trying to figure out how we were using the interactivity of the live stream to like take that to the next level. Yeah, yeah. I think you close. I think you'll ask if you asked 100 DJs, 99 out of 100 would say the reason they love to stream is because they can play whatever they want for however long they want. When mm -hmm. we're out in the field, we pretty much are restricted on playing what the promoter or the club owner, the club manager wants us to play or our clients want us to play. Whereas when you're live streaming on Twitch or whatever platform, mm -hmm. you can play whatever you want and the people are there for it. You can hear rare cuts. You have vinyl DJs. I can play freestyle music, salsa. Mm -hmm. I can play go go music from dc you can't really play that music in a club or in a public platform with you know very long you will get uh escorted out the venue for example last saturday i'm a big as you see right here i'm a big mariah carey fan so as a celebration game partner i played six and a half hours of only mariah carey i couldn't do that in public you know no and so that's the beauty of it. You can play whatever you want for however long you want. And that is very therapeutic for us DJs. And the people love it because they hear the rare grooves, the rare tracks they would never hear out in public or on the radio. And we know about how Spotify, the playlists aren't really that natural. You know, you get paid to place and all that. So this is more organic and natural in my opinion. I love this. So I'm getting this now. So this is more like comparing it to like being an artist, it's like having to play covers or having to play certain things versus getting the opportunity to play your originals in front of people that appreciate them. Exactly, yes. And Love wants it. you to play it again and wants to know why did you write this lyric and why did you sing this and what's the next song you're gonna write and let's write it together. That's what it's like. Got it, that makes a lot of <laughs> sense. So for those that are interested in, in the DJing part, you wanna let them know a little bit about your book? Yes. So DJs mean business. That's my book. We take you through the time slots of a DJ set, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And every 15 minutes, we relate it to growing a business. I'll give you two examples. For example, at 10 o'clock, we're just starting in the club. We're just getting to know all the patrons that are in the club or bar. We're kind of warming up. Same thing in business. When you first start off a business, you're trying to identify kind of your avatar, your ideal client and kind of who you're looking for. We get to one of my favorite chapters, which is 11 p.m. to 11.15 is troubleshooting. As you know, as a musician in DJ world, there's something always goes wrong. Live stream or in live or live. You're like last night, we couldn't get sound up until five minutes before the show. Something always goes wrong. So how do you keep the music going? without stopping. Same thing in business. Maybe something's going wrong in a business and you have to shift to sell some different services, but you can never just close your business and then start it again. So how do you make shifts or pivots? I don't really like the word pivot, but how do you pivot and, and keep going? Um, and then it keeps going on. My favorite chapter, second favorite chapter is like nostalgia. I love to play slow jams at the end of my sets um, because it helps people just end off the night on a high note, reminisce. Maybe if people are there trying to find a mate, they can help them along that way. Mm -hmm. But you'll see businesses mm -hmm. that use nostalgia, the same effect. Old Spice is one of my favorites. They'll use like old music in their commercials. You can look at Adidas with Stan Smith's shoes that are really popular. Different brands use nostalgia. Super Nintendo will do things that brings back old customers, but also attracts new clients. So how can you use nostalgia in your business? And then we just take you through that. That Then the book is over. I have a chapter on feedback. I used to drive for Uber. So after I would party or DJ in the clubs, I would then turn on my little Uber meter, take people home who are just in the same club I was DJing at. I'd ask them, hey, what'd you think of the club? What'd you think of the music? Did you like, you didn't like? Then as we end the drive, I'm like, by the way, you know, I was a DJ tonight, you know, so and it's really fun. That's a that funny is chapter. so cool. That is like super ninja on how exactly, to get feedback. Exactly. Exactly. It's so that's all in the book. And that's the book. I just recorded the audible version with bonus. I have one of my good friends and colleagues, Melissa Majors. She interviews me after each chapter. So that'll be in the audible version that should be out hopefully the next month. 
Um, and that's my book. And now I'm it's working on the second cool. one. I have yeah. to ask, did you ever have anyone say, oh, that music was horrible? <laughs> yes. I had this one guy who said, you know, the DJ, he didn't play enough music to get the ladies on the dance floor. I said, really? I said, that's interesting. What would you have played to get them on the dance floor? So he gave me a few song suggestions. I said, you know, I appreciate the feedback. I was the DJ tonight, so I'm going to take what you suggested, come back in a couple of weeks and see if I've improved or see if I've done better. And he was right. Like I had to play a certain songs he mentioned. Tanache was one song. He said, you gotta play Tanache. The ladies love Tanache. And I did it and it had worked. I said, okay, you're right. You know, thank you. Because if we, we can be open to feedback, then we can truly grow. So, <laughs> but right. most of the time people are very positive, but um, we live and learn. That's right, <laughs> absolutely. So I know you're writing a new book. I wanted to end on this because I thought this was interesting about, about R&B groups and why there aren't very many right now and it's interesting because i just watched that uh show what is it called something about this is pop music yes. or something right and i yes. watched the one on boys to men and i was like it's true there aren't yes. really any around they were huge in the 90s but there aren't yeah. really much around now why do you think that is there's a lot of reasons i think that in like the late 90s early 2000s especially when the music industry was going through probably its lowest time it took that really big dip once uh mp3s came out and there were leaks <clears throat> happened i think that the record labels made a decision to go after and promote and do hip-hop because it's cheaper to produce mm -hmm. it's less members of groups to kind of corral and it's 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 just more challenging then when you dig deeper into it i feel that the recession hurt black R&B groups more because they make their name by going to the mom and pop record stores doing mm -hmm. album signings and little shows there we don't have very many mom and pop record stores anymore so that's gone really we don't have record stores much anymore at all they used to be Best Buy. Now it's pretty much all streaming. So, so let me ask you this, because I know you live near where to, I do. Have you ever been to Rhino Records in Claremont? Not yet. Oh, no. you got to go there. It, okay. But it's just like so nostalgic to me to walk in there. It's like a yeah. real record store. Yeah, which is great. We need more of those. Yes. Um, so the, that went away, so that hurt it. And then, you know, it's just, it's cheaper to really do that. Then you have the introduction of social media and YouTube got to be really big. And that's a very individual thing. Like people can stream and do things individually on YouTube, do the covers, like Justin Bieber got big that way. You add that in. And then the final kind of wild card, which I discovered doing research, is that if you look at the top four African-American magazines, you have Ebony, Jet, Essence, and then you have Vibe. All four of those magazines went out of business from like 2002 to like 2011 or 12. Now they came back in some digital form, but when you take away a total of 10 million monthly subscriptions that would promote black R&B groups consistently, that's a huge hurdle to overcome. And you add all those factors up and it's just, it's just not financially prudent for record companies. People want to kind of mm -hmm. go solo first and then maybe create a group second. Look at Silk Sonic, Bruno Mars, and Anderson Pac. That might be the new model of the future. So the book is really on why there are no longer any black R&B groups on the Billboard Hot 100 since 2004. Um, and as you spoke about that documentary, This Is Pop, Boys to Men and TLC in the 90s, which is kind of the heyday, are the only two black R&B groups to achieve diamond status in terms of sales. No more after, no more before. And I think that that was just the heyday and it's it's gonna take a lot to come back consistently. And I, I'm not sure if it will happen, but I love doing the research and interviewing people. It's fascinating. It's the topic for my thesis in grad school. And I just discovered so much information that's just, it just makes you shake your head, but makes you say, wow, at the same time. Yeah, it's super interesting about the shifts in the industry. The one thing I do wonder, and I know, you know, there are still groups, right? But like you said, they're not necessarily black R&B groups. Like, for example, Pentatonix, right? They're huge. And and I was thinking when you were saying about, you know, it makes more sense that people are going solo because it's cheaper to have one member and then they can go, you know, live stream directly and they don't have to try to figure out how to, you know, be virtual and sing together and that kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. Yet Pentatonix is, is doing yeah. great. So why do you think mm -hmm. that there are a few groups that are doing well, even though they may not be black R&B groups? No, I think that the music public loves groups. We love groups. We love to learn about the different members, see them work together, see them in videos, dancing. It's just that it takes a lot of work 
to be a group and be consistent over a long amount of time. And I think the way that our world is shifting is that people would rather do the work themselves and just have the reap the benefits of themselves and put the work in to be in a group, to do all the choreography, to go on tour together, to have to get along with someone for uh-huh. five, seven or nine years. Like that's a lot of work. And when once you've seen ways you can do it by yourself, you don't want to go back. And I think that's the challenge. Um, and we haven't even talked about like songwriting and, and mm. getting all that revenue, which is a whole different topic, but. Yeah, you know, are you gonna split it evenly, even uh, though some of the people in the group are writing most of the songs, yes. yeah, it does get messy. Yes. It's messy quick. And once you've seen a way where it doesn't have to be messy, you're like, I think I'm gonna go do this because it's less stressful, it's easier. The groups are hard. Hopefully mm. we find some people that wanna put the hard work in because I feel that it could be even better than going solo, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And I'm such a like pop music culture nerd. I just had to talk about this because I know <laughs> it has course. nothing to do with what we talk about on the podcast. But I think it's super interesting to people that are into that kind of thing like I am. So thanks for indulging me on that. And I'm looking forward to your book. Yes, yes, me too. So let people know, how can they find you? How can they come watch one of your live streams? And how can they connect with you on social media? Social media is just at Amani Experience on like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, twitch.tv backslash Amani Experience. My website's amaniexperience.com. Right now, my streaming schedule is Sundays at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. And then Mondays and Wednesdays is around 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That's when I stream. And sometimes I do pop-ups and you can find me on Instagram, reach out, LinkedIn is Amani Roberts. And that's where you can reach me. My book's in Amazon, DJs Mean Business. It'll be on Audible very soon. And just reach out and I'll always respond back and chat with you. And where do we find the game shows? Because I think I want to check that out. <laughs> so game shows, Wednesdays, game night. So Wednesdays is game night. And then usually the first three Mondays of the month is also game night. So for example, we're doing the premiere of Wheel of Fortune this coming Monday. And then Wednesday, we have the match game. And that's a fun one. That's just like the show that Alec Baldwin hosts. So that's game night. Wednesdays, you'll have games every week. That's awesome. Okay, it's Amani, A-M-A-N-I experience, you guys, if you want to go out and check him out and watch all the cool things that he does on live streaming (laughs) and how he's monetizing multiple streams of income from one show. Yes, exactly. I love how you say stack the income streams. I'm going to borrow that with your permission. Okay, you may borrow it. (laughs) Credit me. (laughs) Yeah, I will, of course. (laughs) Well, Thank you so much. I'm so glad we got together and talked about this today. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure, Bree, and please just continue to do what you're doing. As I said before, offline, I share your work with my students. It's very valuable, so keep it coming. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.